So uh, I'm Sean Riley. I'm from uh, Darklight. I'm the chief visionary officer there. Uh, I'm going to be starting off this session and uh, talking about modern AI expert systems for active defense. And then uh, Mike from Route 9B is going to come up and uh, talk about lessons learned and how they're using uh, Darklight within their, their uh, operations. So I'm just waiting for my first slide deck, part one, for this to get projected. There we go. So I want to start off talking about three key automation technologies that have similar value propositions because they're all trying to automate aspects of what a human would do within that operation center. And I want to start off and, and make it very clear, you know, while I'm going to primarily talk about uh, expert systems and, and how they're applied, um, I believe all three of these are required technologies. They're each solving a different piece of the puzzle. When we think about knowledge engineering derived AI, it's really focused in on integrated knowledge and being able to integrate all these different models and frameworks that we as humans use to make sense of the information that we're seeing. It's also focused in on mimicking how humans apply that integrated knowledge. When we get down to uh, thinking about the type of reasoning, it applies deterministic reasoning to determine whether it is a true positive or a false positive. You don't have any probabilistic type of, of reasoning within our system. On a security orchestrator, you know, it's really focused in on the integrated technology piece and really being able to apply kind of the conditional statements, if then else, to perform different actions and automate different actions for the humans, right? Go do a search for this. Go detonate this file in a sandbox. When we think about data science-derived AI, that's really focused in on the different data silos that we have. It's applying that probabilistic reasoning on the patterns to determine whether or not it's a pattern of interest. You know, does it represent a threat or a risk? And really, that really saves the human from digging through all the logs. When I first started out in cybersecurity uh, as a human, I had to go and, and dig through all of those event logs out of all the different servers and, and stuff. And that was mainly a manual process where you're doing greps and things like that to search for, for things of interest. And that's really saved us, this application of data science has really saved us from having to go out and dig through all those piles of data for the most time. But it uses probabilistic reasoning, which means that you have to accept a certain amount of false positives that go along with it. Because it's always going to have a certain amount of false positives that go with it. Even if you get it up to where it's really accurate, it's going to be like 99 point something and you're still going to have a certain amount of error within there. So what is an expert system? An expert system in the yellow there, you can see there's three core architectural components for every expert system. There's a knowledge base, and this is where we store all that integrated knowledge. There's an inference engine, sometimes called a reasoning engine, and that's where we can infer facts out of any of that integrated knowledge in the knowledge base based on the information that we're looking at. And then you have a user interface, right, to where the user can interact with, with that knowledge base. So, and then we have kind of the unique aspects. So, we were the very first expert system on the market to integrate the concept of cognitive playbooks. And we did that to align to this community. This community was, was working on and developing playbooks, and we were asked to, to kind of align with that. So, Rather than developing action playbooks that an orchestrator focused on, we focused on cognitive playbooks. And we wanted to make sure right from the very beginning that all of those playbooks could be shared. They're all importable and exportable along with any file dependencies that they have. We really focus in on, on creating domain-specific ontologies, and these are uh, W3C standardized OWL, the ontological web language uh, version two, and uh, uses description logic. And in uh, 2013, we founded our company uh, to do a technology transfer out of the Pacific Northwest National Labs of the patented reasoning uh, capability. And uh, that basically allows us to spin up a small micrograph 
and maintain logical consistency over that logical, over that small micrograph in order to get uh, a correct answer out of it. The bigger your graph gets, the harder it is to maintain logical consistency for reasoning and over it, so we have this ability to segment it off and only spin up the part of the graph that we need to answer the question. So when I talk about integrated knowledge, what do I really mean, especially when we talk about the topic of active defense? Well, we're, we're really talking about being able to integrate what do we know about the adversaries? What do we know about their tactics, techniques, and procedures? What do we know about the technology that they're using? So being able to integrate and organize using those, those ontologies to organize what's known about the adversaries and how they use the terrain, their techniques. And so you really think about you know, our ability to not only organize what's known, but our ability to produce threat intelligence is along that top side. When you think about that bottom side, you want that ability to support the consumption of threat intelligence. You want to understand, you know, all of your assets that are in the ecosystem. You want the ability to do threat hunting. You want the ability to do incident response when you find something. And you want the ability to manipulate that ecosystem in order to have an effect on the adversary's behavior. The other kind of key part of, of being an expert system is that we focus in on mimicking human experts and how they apply the knowledge. And so these four roles are the roles that we've initially identified that we want Darklight to imitate. And so the very first one we, we focused on is the cyber defense analyst and the threat warning analyst and then the defense, uh, cyber defense incident responder, and then finally the cyber crime investigator. Now all of these uh, roles are out of the NICE cybersecurity workforce framework out of DHS, and uh, all of these have defined abilities, knowledge, skills, and tasks that each role is designed to do. So if you think about, in order for a human or in AI, in our case, to have the ability to do some task, you have to have that knowledge integrated into it, which is where those ontologies come from. We can integrate that knowledge. And then our cognitive playbooks capture the skills of those human roles applying the knowledge to solve problems in support of different tasks that they want to do. Now, there are certain tasks and, and abilities that are still human only, but of those that could be automated or augmented, We've added those to our roadmap and have started integrating those into the technology. So when we think about comparing the kind of data science-derived AI, such as machine learning or deep learning, with the knowledge engineering side, it helps to kind of do a side-by-side -side comparison. So if we look in the blue, we can see that what DOD refers to as non-symbolic AI, which just means it's the data science side. And uh, it focuses on machine learning. It uses algorithms and models. It uses and applies inductive inference and probabilistic reasoning. Uh, and it uses that to make predictions or generally tentative hypotheses about what that pattern is. And a lot of times, how it arrived at that conclusion is a black box. We don't know exactly how it arrived at that conclusion, although there has been some progress on trying to make uh, the data science side a little bit more explainable, although I'm seeing more progress outside of cybersecurity in that realm than I am seeing inside cybersecurity. On the symbolic AI side, or the knowledge engineering side, which is used to create expert systems, we use cognitive playbooks and ontologies rather than the algorithms and models. We use deductive inference and deterministic reasoning, which applies the, the logic behind those models. And we mainly focus in on the validation of a hypothesis to determine whether it's a true positive or a false positive and, and applying deterministic reasoning. And everything that we do on the knowledge engineering side is 100% transparent, explainable, and reproducible. Another good way to kind of think about the difference between inductive and deductive is to look at them, how, they, how these two types of AI kind of work within that scientific method. So when we think about the data science side, which is a yellow piece there, it's really focused in on the data 
and observing the data, looking for those patterns, and then through inductive, inductive reasoning, being able to produce a tentative hypothesis. Now, when we think about the topic of zero trust and the fact that all the results coming off of the data science side are conjecture until you verify them, it means that it's just a probable result, right, until it's, until it's verified. When I asked uh, Chase over at Forrester, Chase Cunningham, uh, in a zero trust model, should we trust the conjecture being produced by machine learning solutions, or do they require verification? He says, well, it definitely requires verification. So if you're moving in a zero trust architecture and you're thinking about, well, mainly that's focused in on users and devices at the moment, if you're going to do, uh, say that you're zero trust, you, know, you, you need to make sure that you're verifying all the results coming off your machine learning because they're just probabilities. On the knowledge engineering side, we really focus in on being able to take a hypothesis and look at the observations or the evidence and validate whether or not it's true. So, and if, you, if you're not applying a knowledge engineering based expert system, then it's the humans that have to do that verification because they're the only ones that have the integrated knowledge in order to understand it and verify it. Another good way to kind of look at uh, the models or the ontologies that are used within an expert system compared to kind of the, the data models that data science uses. You know, data science is really good at being, a, being applied to the different data silos. So it's generally using that schema for that, for that data set to understand the modeling of that data. Whereas, uh, with knowledge engineering derived AI, we're using ontologies. I mentioned that we're using OWL. You can see OWL in that, that upper circle there. And it uses description logic. And so when you think about uh, interoperability, you know, down at, in the red area, you're really focused in on syntactic interoperability. Uh, and so when you think about um, a lot of your databases, they're great for understanding stuff within there. But as soon as you send that over to somebody else, they generally don't understand that, that data. Uh, when you get up into structural interoperability, I tend to think of examples like uh, Sticks is a great example of structural interoperability. Um, so if you're sending stuff between, say, a Sticks producer and another Sticks producer or a Sticks consumer, they should be able to understand that. But as soon as you take Sticks and start looking at it in the context of other models or other data sets, then you don't have that semantic interoperability. And so one of the things that we're really focused in on is being able to have semantic interoperability within our, within our integrated knowledge to understand that something like a Stix attack pattern is the same thing as uh, an ODNI cyber threat framework action, right? And, and so if I have a bunch of data that's in the ODNI aligned to the ODNI cyber threat framework, and a bunch of data that's in sticks, I need to be able to understand that they're really talking about the same piece of data or the same entity using two different names. We also have that ability to encode additional metadata and knowledge representation within the ontologies for how to reason over the data or how to handle the data. So here's an example of, of axioms. How many in the audience, just, just give me a, a quick show of hands, have heard of the diamond model of intrusion analysis. So quite a few people have read those. Now, if you read the paper, in the paper they contain seven axioms of how the defender who's reading that and using that model should use these as a basis for reasoning over the information aligned to that model. So axioms are, are a piece of an ontology that we can actually encode in that ontology so that the AI can use those axioms as a way to start reasoning over the data. So within Darklight, we have, uh, I don't know, 75 or so different ontologies, and you can see a subset of those that I, I use in my system uh, on, the, on the side there. And I've kind of called them out, some of the different types of ontologies that we have. So we have ontologies that represent uh, enterprise information, so things like people and devices and, and things like that, all your kind of 
of identify all your software, hardware, users, privileged users, all that type of things. Those are all examples of enterprise ontologies. We also have sensor-based ontologies where we're pulling in different data sets. So um, an easy example of that is Sysmon or Windows event logs, right? Those are examples of sensor-based ontologies. And then we have different ontologies to represent different either dictionaries or different frameworks or different um, taxonomies. So KPEC is an example of, of the common attack patterns, uh, enumeration and classification. It's an example of, of a, an attack pattern dictionary, often used with uh, CVE and CWE, the common vulnerabilities enumeration and the common weakness of enumeration. Then you have MITRE's attack, and I think everybody has heard of MITRE's attack. Uh, that represents information. Now, MITRE's attack generally will, they have their, their taxonomy, but when they represent it within sticks and share that information as sticks, they have all the techniques down as, as sticks attack patterns, and then they list the kill chain as the attack framework and the kill chain phase as the tactics. Now, this gets a, a little bit confusing when you move into something like the ODNI cyber threat framework or the NSA technical cyber threat framework, where they actually have four layers of stages, objectives, actions, and indicators, because MITRE attack actually aligns up to where all the techniques are actions and all the tactics are objectives. And those objectives happen at different stages of the cyber attack life cycle. So if a human was using both a cyber threat framework, pick your choice of, of which agency you want to use, or, and along with uh, MITRE's attack, it's the human that has to kind of understand, well, really, this, these, what they're calling a kill chain in, in MITRE's attack representation is really the objectives of the adversary and what, those, what the techniques are going to do. Uh, when we get down to uh, uh, kind of the defender side, so all of those kind of frameworks, the cyber threat framework, uh, sticks, MITRE's attack, and even KPEC are really talking about the adversary, right, and how we represent information about the adversary. Uh, the, di the Digital Forensics Incident Response Community, DFIR, uh, has been developing a cyber investigation analysis standard expression. So what sticks is for threat intelligence, case is for the investigation. So it's really designed to capture uh, this is what I did and this is who, di who did it. This is where I got this trace of evidence from. It's all of those kind of stuff. So if, if I was going to investigate an incident, I'm going to capture all the stuff about the adversary and share it as sticks, but I'm going to capture all the step-by-step -step stuff I did as an investigator as case. And case is a, a profile or uses or leverages the unified cyber ontology, which is really an upper-level ontology designed to work across threat intelligence cyber investigations, and, and a number of other uh, kind of silos that align underneath that unified cyber ontology. So if you can kind of think of the, the top ones, the enterprise and the sensor ontologies as kind of being your low, lower level ontologies, then you think about these middle ones as being things like MITRE's attack or the ODNI cyber threat framework, and then you have these upper level ontologies, such as the unified cyber ontology that can look across your threats and your risks and your investigations and understand concepts across those. And then we have this ability to create swirl reasoning or inference rules, right? And this is the ability within the knowledge models or within the ontologies to say, well, this is how I'm going to reason over it. So if you think about uh, a, a playbook, whether it's an action playbook or a cognitive playbook, they, they have that ability to apply conditional statements but this is a way of capturing rules for reasoning within an ontology that can then apply to any of the knowledge represented in the knowledge base. So security orchestration playbooks, as I mentioned, take advantage of that conditional statements of if, then, else. And they really focus in on, on all their API integrations because they really need to have an API integration out to all the different technologies to be able to take actions with those. And they're increasingly starting to focus in on the integration of OpenC2 to support kind of those atomic action commands. A cognitive playbook also has 
uh, the ability to apply those conditional statements. So it, when the playbook starts off, it says, you know, I'm going to pull data in, and it's going to, it has the ability to apply those conditional statements before we reify it and turn it into a graph and map it to those knowledge models. But once we map it to the knowledge models, uh, such as mapping stuff to, to sticks or mapping stuff to one of the enterprise ontologies, then we have this ability to start supporting inference. And inference, we can do rules-based inference, which you can, you can see there. And we also have the ability to do ontology-based inference. So if you think about uh, the T-box up there, it's really containing all of those controlled vocabularies from sticks or MITRE's attack or the ODNI cyber threat framework or NSA's technical cyber threat framework or the vocabulary that describes Sysmon events or, or Windows events. And then in the A box, you have all of the data or the instances of data that map to those frameworks or those controlled vocabularies. So if you think about MITRE's attack, the controlled vocabulary on there is tactics and techniques. The instances of tactics and techniques are what would be in the A box. So uh, a T1086 PowerShell would be an example of something that's in that A box. But it, that power of being able to map the data to an ontology so the, the AI can understand the meaning of the data, and then based on the meaning of that data, be able to make inferences from it. And we'll go through an example here in a couple slides to, to better talk about what that means. Cognitive playbooks, for the most part, focus in on, on sense making and decision making. And we've really made sure that they could support automating things like argument-driven inquiry, where we're really trying to automate the claims, evidence, reasoning type framework. And our cognitive playbooks are really made up of, of a lot of steps. You can see input steps, uh, transformation steps where you might want to apply uh, uh, reg regular expressions or normalized dates, uh, filtering steps to filter out you know, strings or numbers or, or whatever you want to filter for, Query steps where this is where we put our, our API integrations. So a lot of our API integrations uh, have been focused in on integrating different types of security information event management systems because that's where we'll pull the data from. And, uh, and also the ability to do different types of analysis steps, including using that description logic reasoner that, that invokes the inference engine. And then you have a bunch of output steps. And the output steps you have is where we traditionally take and, and focus on different actions that we might take. And so that might be you know, posting to Slack or posting to Teams or sending open C2 messages to an orchestrator for an orchestrator to then take some kind of action, um, as well as being able to produce you know, things like, like sticks to share that off with the community. So, what really is argument-driven inquiry, since that's a typical use case? So if you think about you know, building up a, a scientific argument, most of the, the analyst investigator roles within cyber defense, they're all security science roles, as opposed to the security engineering roles that do architecture, development, engineering. So most of these guys have some kind of requirement. In fact, when you get into the intelligence community, they have a requirement under uh, the intelligence community analytic standards to use logical argumentation when they're describing activity. And so when you think about, well, making claims in an argument, there's kind of you know, five basic claims that we kind of look at, and that's you know, a claim of a definition. What is this? You know, a fact. So did it happen? What, does it exist? You know, the value, is it good or bad? Um, policy. You know, if I see something, what should I do about it? and cause and effect, what caused it, right? So those are different types of claims that we can make based on the evidence. So when we look at uh, a cognitive playbook that's applying this, and you can see along the side here uh, a screenshot from our, our playbook manager, and you can just see a, this kind of a, a subset of all the different uh, behavioral indicator playbook. So these aren't indicators as in an IP address or a domain name or a file hash. These are indicators for behavior. And so we really focused in on, on behaviors of the adversary and how do we detect and verify 
especially if it's something, if they're using legitimate tools within our environment that our, our legitimate users are using, how do we apply deterministic reasoning to actually verify that this is something bad? And that's what all of these playbooks are focused in on. We have close to 100 playbooks that focus in on, uh, on MITRE attack techniques on the Windows uh, Enterprise. And so this one particular playbook is looking at, at PowerShell, and so it will go through and it will identify, out of all the things that are using PowerShell in my environment, it will filter out, and it has that ability to apply uh, a couple different filters, and, and you can uh, use what we call collections, which are, are collections of blacklist, whitelist, to filter out different things that you, you care about or don't care about. In this case, it's filtering out all the, all the stuff that I don't care about, and it's making sure that, that none of these PowerShells were done by an authorized application or an authorized user, and then it's getting down to just the one that I care about, and then it's going to go through and uh, after it identifies the fact that there's a, a, an indicator for an adversary behavior in there, then it will start running these sub-playbooks. Now, rather than having to encode all of that subroutines that we do er for every one of the Windows indicator playbooks, we created sub-playbooks. So we can focus the top playbook on detecting the behavioral indicator, and then it can start calling a sub-playbook. So the first one that it's gonna call is, is to create that indicator and create containers for where that indicator lives. So in this case, it's gonna create an indicator for uh, a T1086 PowerShell event, and then it's gonna cr create uh, containers of where that is. And so it can infer things like the objective of the adversary and what stage of the cyber attack lifecycle it is. As it runs through these different sub playbooks, so Active Directory at Attribution uh, will run uh, a sub playbook and that sub playbook will do Technique Pre-Attribution Separator. So basically what that means is it's looking at the Sysmon and the Windows Event Log and it's, it's identifying the person and the device in those two different file formats. It's extracting those so that way we can get uh, detailed information on the employee and device to do attribution of who is this employee, what department are they in, who, where is this device at, who owns that device, what department is that in. So that way we can use that for reasoning in the next steps and then we have the ability to do uh, a NIST impact assessment and automate that so that way we can look at the device, the type of activity, what device it was on, what user was involved, and then based on, on that and the parts of the business that it's supporting, assess the impact of that. And if the impact is sufficient enough, it will automatically declare an incident uh, based on that impact. So um, what it tries to do, all of these cognitive playbooks are working to build a logical argument. So it's taking the observed facts coming from the sensor it's taking asserted facts from contextual knowledge, so Active Directory asserted that this user is this and, and this device is this, and we can start tying those together to the evidence, and then we can start inferring facts into it and creating a logical argument that ties it all together. So, and, and what do I mean by that? So here's an example of that PowerShell playbook running, now the graph there is a simplified graph in that it's representing maybe one-tenth of the full graph information about this, so just the primary objects there. But down in the bottom, you can see that Windows event log, and then the playbook ran and it detected an indicator for an adversary behavior on there, and then it went out and it gathered up the contextual information to say, uh, what the device is and, and what the user is. And then it, up at the top are all the inferences that are made. So the, the NIST impact was inferred, the incident was inferred, uh, that particular attack pattern based on that adversary behavior that was detected was inferred. And so that adversary behavior becoming a sticks attack pattern that's basically an adversary action in the cyber threat framework and so within MITRE ATT&CK, we can say, well, that's the tactic of execution. Above that, we, we say, well, that's really within the cyber threat framework of the ODNI's stages of, of presence. And on the other side, we can see the NSA technical cyber threat framework where it's, it basically maps uh, 
pretty close to it, but it's not always, it's not always the same. We can also see from the incident there in the middle that it's recommending courses of action. So it, it had encoded knowledge that, hey, if you see this behavior, you should recommend this course of action. It also took two automated courses of action, such as creating an incident response ticket and uh, posting a notification to Slack. So we often talk about how we're kind of emulating stuff that other people are doing. So the intelligence community, in order to move past siloed, uh, silos of information, applied knowledge engineering. We, when, the, when the intelligence community talks about how they've applied AI in their spaces to start doing some more advanced things, one of the first things that they did about five years ago was focus in on knowledge engineering. So this provides a controlled vocabulary for all their intelligence, people, places, and things that they care about, and then it's able to map all of those things that they care about to those controlled vocabularies in the ontologies. And this, by organizing what you know based on those knowledge models, you can then start applying activity-based intelligence, which requires object-based production. So you're basically organizing all that, all that knowledge, and then once you organize what's known, then it supports the ability to monitor the known knowns, to research the unknown knowns, to search for the known unknowns, and, and to discover unknown unknowns, right? And they've proven this within the IC. So, and if you think about, you know, if you're trying to, if you're uh, looking at an object or a, a device, and you're aligning all the things that you know about that device and all your data sets there, you can go out to that device and discover new activity that it's doing. Same thing if you search for a particular activity, you can generally find people or devices that are doing that activity that you weren't aware of. We generally, we've been focused a lot on, on identifying the known knowns because you want to focus on identifying all the known knowns and then moving into the unknown unknowns. So when we think about integrating all that knowledge together, you know, and, and using something like the kill chain, when Lockheed Martin introduced their, their kill chain paper, a lot of people really know the kill chain, but they kind of forget about what Lockheed said was the essence of intelligence-driven defense, which is understanding the adversary's behavior in the context of your enterprise uh, solutions, right? So you're doing all these things to defend against those adversary behaviors and have some kind of an effect on the adversary. Now, those effects along the top were taken from the 2006 uh, information operations uh, area, so they're more DOD-centric. When we think about moving a decade forward, we really want to focus in on resiliency effects. Now, these are our uh, resiliency effects out of NIST 800-160 Volume 2, and they're really supporting uh, redirect and preclude and impede, limit and expose, and there's 14 kind of subcategories there. And within dark light, along the top, you can see those resiliency effects, and on the up and down axis here, you can see the stages of the cyber attack lifecycle from the ODNI cyber threat framework, along with what's visible there are the 26 different objectives that are represented by MITRE's attack tactics. And underneath those tactics are all the techniques underneath there, and there's hundreds of those, so it's impossible to get a good screenshot showing everything. But as you move across, a lot of those notes that you see in the middle, a lot of those little icons that are dotted along there, that's where we've mapped out all of the resiliency effects or all the resiliency techniques and approaches that are outlined in that NIST 800-160 volume two, so you could see exactly what effect if you implemented something like con continuous mitigation or continuous uh, mitigation and diagno diagnostics and mitigation uh, or an intrusion detection system, it's going to have the effect of detect and scrutinize, right? So and if you think about all of those effects really align to things like protection, so there's protection effects there are detection effects, there are uh, uh, re uh, response effects, and there's recovery. So 
if you think about throwing something over to a sandbox, that's scrutinizing. If you think about posting a message to Slack or to Teams or sharing threat intelligence, that's revealing stuff about the adversary. If you employ deception techniques, it's got its own column of deceive, right? But it's a way of mapping out all of your investments to what effect you're going to have on the adversary. So that way, when you're talking about different actions that you want to automate, you want to understand what effect you're having. So by understanding the effect that I'm going to have on the adversary through a particular action that I'm going to take, then you'll be, you'll be able to understand where to go look for evidence as to whether you actually had that effect or not. How effective was the action at having the desired effect on the adversary? If it wasn't very, a, a very effective action, then you want to make sure to note that so that way you can work on improving that uh, action and having a better effect on the adversary the next time that activity happens. It's also great, and I'll put up some, uh, some use cases here in a second. The other thing, when you think about every kind of adversary action in the ecosystem and your responses and how you're going to get data from it, it's good to understand it in the context of the cyber terrain. So the cyber terrain is a model that we use to understand the cyber ecosystem. IACD has been really good about saying everybody brings their own enterprise and everybody has their own things in their enterprise. But if we want to understand the enterprise from kind of a data and, and layers of data and technology perspective, this really works well. Because if you think about, you have the old, the old 30 year old OSI model down in there for layers one through seven. All of those physical devices and cables are geographically located somewhere. Then you have things like uh, machine language. So you think about, you get something in your, your BIOS on your motherboard, we want to be able to represent that. Uh, operating systems, software applications, persona, so anything that ties a person to a software application or the OS, and then people, organizations, and government. So this really helps us, you know, when you're thinking about, if I'm looking at a PowerShell, well, obviously I can detect that through layer nine, the operating system logs. I can also detect that through a, 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 an additional sensor like Sysmon loaded on the operating system. But, you know, is PowerShell going to download an application? If so, then I need to think about that. Um, is it going to make network communications? If so, where do I get those network communication logs from? Right? So it allows a, a defender to really think through where do I need to pull different pieces of information to pull them together? And then having a model of this allows the AI to understand the, the layers of terrain and if you can start identifying and mapping out, well, for this type of adversary action, you're going to see data from the different layers where it might be observed, then all of a sudden you can start reasoning and have the AI start reasoning as to where to look for different pieces of data for different types of activity. So here's the, some of the different use cases for that cyber effects matrix that maps the adversaries on one side to the different effects along the top. So you think about it, it being able to support, you know, a common model for mapping out intrusions and the chain of events that happen. Uh, it supports, you know, uh, kind of vendor bake-offs. You know, if I'm looking at two different vendors who are, are both providing similar capabilities, I can map them out based on not only what uh, adversary tactics and techniques they're detecting, but what effect can they actually have on, on the adversary behavior. And so then it also supports things like red team, blue team, purple team. And uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Mike. And Mike from Route 9B will talk about the, the lessons learned and, and how they've been applying the technology within their ecosystem. And please transition over to the second set of slides. So um, my name is Mike Forgione. I work for Route 9B. I'm in the uh, managed security services uh, area doing a lot of the engineering. Uh, Route 9B, just a quick overview, we offer a lot of security services, uh, MSS and MDR, DFER, uh, training, red team, all that stuff uh, internationally. So. So the first thing that we need to look at is we need to address the problem with the SIM. Uh, SIM is expensive, it can take a lot of engineering resources, and it's overwhelming. The amount of data that is flowing through a SIM at any point can be hundreds of gigs, if not terabytes. 
So when you start looking at that and you start applying an, uh, a human analyst to that, there's no way that they're going to find everything that's going through. So with this, um, <clears throat> you, have to, you have to have engineers that are trained to optimize to get rid of all of the false positives, make sure that everything is nice and tuned and, and working correctly. Uh, you also have to have analysts who are comfortable with working with data. <clears throat> Our current architecture for uh, Darklight is uh, we've got data coming in from a customer network going into Logstash. At Logstash, we're duplicating the data and we're sending one stream to Kafka and then the other stream to an Elastic Stack. Uh, the Elastic Stack is the SIM that we're using for this specific customer, so the engineering resources and all of that are dedicated to Elastic, while I kind of get to play with Kafka and Darklight. This is a secondary, more of a dev uh, environment that we have configured. So as you can see, we have Darklight in the center that's reaching out to Splunk it's running queries in Splunk to pull back specific information, whereas we also have an Elastic Stack that is sending data to Kafka and throwing it into Darklight. And then we also have Darklight reaching into an EDR solution in the cloud to pull down contextual data. Everything is getting processed in Darklight and then getting thrown over to a threat enrichment, and then at, from threat enrichment, it's sending to incident management. Uh, this, all of this is basically just helping speed up the analysis and the discovery. Uh, we want to make sure that reaction time is at a minimal, especially when we're operating with large data sets. So again, this is just kind of an, uh, an overview. Uh, we do have an example of a query that we are running in Splunk. Uh, basically doing a generic search for failed logins or event code 4625. Um, but we can also do more intricate queries if we're looking for specific things. But the, the positive side to using Darklight to run these queries is we're able to take in large numbers of, of uh, events, process them down, make sure that everything is working correctly, and then start alerting on them in no time at all. So in our real-time Kafka feed, we have hundreds of gigs uh, right now. I think the last time I checked, uh, we, I've got a 24-hour data retention policy on that. It's operating at about 220 gigs a day. All of that is being thrown to Darklight, and it's being processed in real time. So what does that mean? Who, who cares, right? So basically, Darklight is constantly running on all of this data, putting all of this stuff together, processing it, and getting it out in real time. So there's no more delay of waiting for a human analyst to look through 14,000 lines of, of SIM data to find that one anomaly or that one weird thing and we need to start looking into it. This is all happening in real time. So as I said, Root9b does uh, M MDR. With MDR, we are actually able to, or we, we have a requirement to actually know what's going on at the endpoint as well as on the network. We have to be able to detect and respond in as near real time as possible. What Darklight is allowing us to do is to build up all of the indicators, all of the known knowns, and then task out uh, hunt platforms so that the hunt can be uh, automated, reach out, collect, and pull data back so that an analyst can start to, to properly uh, analyze it, make sure that it's not something that we need to start a, an actual uh, defer engagement. Uh, we're also able to speed up the, uh, not only detection, but the response time. So with that collection, instead of it waiting for an analyst to go out, collect, analyze, and then go out, collect again, because it might have been, um, you know, something weird happened, or they didn't collect all the indicators, or they didn't collect during the certain window time that had an indicator sitting in memory, or, or something like that. If this is actually able to, as soon as it sees an indicator, as soon as it sees any type of tipping, it's going to jump out and, and start collecting everything and pull it back. 
uh, our goal, um, our roadmap, we are going to be, or I'm going to be working on, uh, this, here we go. I'm gonna be working on integrating this further, uh, start bringing in more external resources so that we're getting more contextual data as well as um, more enriched data going into Darklight. So when Darklight is just running, it's running at a, uh, it's just constantly going. Um, I also am planning on uh, integrating this directly with uh, Orion. Uh, Orion is proprietary root 9b uh, hunt platform. So what we'll be able to do is we'll actually be able to leverage Darklight to communicate directly with Orion, collect everything, pull it back, analysis can be run and automated to where the entire hunt, um, the, the hunt aspect of MDR is actually automated to a point where response time is immediate. And then finally, we're, I'm working on building out uh, other ways of detecting. So one of the things that's not up here is trying to build a dark light that is monitoring dark light, right? So dark light clusters are running against uh, individual customers. I want a dark light that is looking at all of the data that dark light is put, putting out and start correlating so that it can see what's going on across multiple customers. How do we look at uh, the patterns that are happening over here, over here, and over here, and then output, hey, we might be targeted. You know, it's a big deal right now with MSPs being targeted through customers or for their customers. So now we can start looking at the entire uh, vertical. We can start looking at ourselves as well as you know, what's happening out in the wild. Uh, so I have um, any questions? We've about, we have about five minutes for questions. Please step up to the microphones if you have anything you'd like to ask these guys. I will say that uh, if you have questions, I put a, a stack of my business cards out on the dark light sponsor table in the uh, in the uh, entryway there. Uh, feel free to pick up a card and, and shoot me any emails if you want. Yes, Chip. Hey, Sean. Uh, just, uh, are you guys looking ahead at maybe incorporating some of the user roles in uh, an actual uh, customer or users into the ontology and to, the, uh, to provide more context maybe to the activity you're seeing on the network or you look well, at we do try to we do try to encode uh, uh, the experience of working with the data sets into the ontologies mm -hmm. to include being able to create uh, swirl reasoning rules inside the knowledge so that way you can logically reason over the knowledge that you have and the evidence that you have. To, to support more advanced inferences based on particular roles and how particular roles would, would respond to that, that data. Okay, because I, I'm just thinking that, you know, something might seem, be unusual for, you know, one, depending on the organization and what they do as a business, uh, how, how that might look, something sup suspicious on one part of the network happening like in the HR section versus something happening over in, in uh, product development or something like that, you know. So. Yeah, well, part of the, one of the reasons why we bring in uh, the contextual information that we do whenever we, we detect an adversary behavior, we want to understand what part of the business that's happening in, so that way we can we can not only assess the impact of that, but understand whether that's something that's normal in that area and maybe not normal in another area. So it, it's really important for us to bring in that contextual information about the the person in the device and what parts of the business that they're in. How do you look at historical data? Um, it seems like a lot of the stuff that would be contextual would be of immediate time frame. Do you look at you know historical over a period of time as well when you're doing your uh, assessments? Uh, you know when you're building up your deterministic reasoning and stuff yep. like that. And how far back do you keep that data, or do you look to try to keep that data? So one of the really great things about knowledge engineering is that we don't have to become a data lake or a data warehouse. We can actually leave the data where it's at, create a model of that data, where it's living, and then just understand how to reach out and, and connect to it. So if you already have 
you know, your historical data repository, we can actually create a model of that and understand all that, that history that's in there. And then as we update the ontological models or update the ontologies to represent new information or new axioms, or we update the playbooks to be able to detect new things, we can always reach back out into that historical data as long as the organization is maintaining that and get the answer or, or determine if there's a new answer based on new knowledge that I have. Yeah, and, and one other thing to, uh, to address your question, um, the way that we operate is we do operate a SIM alongside. So if you want to have your data lake, you want to have your SIM, you want to have your data store for, you know, historical investigations or anything like that, it's perfectly acceptable and, and you can continue to operate at real time with that historical stuff. So. I'll, I'll give you a, a, another kind of really good, I guess, understanding of the way that we kind of approach it. So when I think about contextual information within Darklight, we have a concept of adversarial contextual knowledge and enterprise contextual knowledge. Adversarial contextual knowledge is where we want to organize all the things about uh, the adversary. So we've pulled in all of the adversary playbooks from places like Unit 42 and, and the Cyber Threat Alliance members and thrown those into, into contextual knowledge, adversarial contextual knowledge, along with the entire contents of the entire MITRE attack knowledge repository. And that's all integrated and then we can take the stuff that's coming out of, out of uh, the adversary playbooks like Unit 42 where they use the kill chain plus MITRE attack and then look at stuff in MITRE attack where they don't have any indicators and then we can pull in threat intelligence and organize all that together into adversarial contextual knowledge and then we can organize what we know about the assets, the people, places, things of, in our enterprise, configurations or whatever in enterprise contextual knowledge and then all of the rest of that becomes transactions and activities that you're trying to make sense of. So, and a lot of those transactions and activities are what gets stored in your historical uh, repositories of, of knowledge. So I wanna keep Windows events for three years or whatever. Um, those are all transaction activities. So within Darklight, we really focus in on, on organizing the kind of stuff about the people, places, and things, so that way all of the transaction and activity stuff can still get stored in the SIM or the data lake or, or wherever it lives.